thanks everyone for dialing in this afternoon. I uh, appreciate your time, or this afternoon, this evening. Um, I'm going to run through a presentation um, on the um, Henderson Small Companies Investment Trust. Um, I'm going to touch on um, team, um, kind of a bit about the process, a bit about performance, and I suppose the outlook for the market going forward. And obviously, appreciate any questions you've got um, to ask. So, just to introduce myself, I'm Neil Herman. Um, I've been um, at Janice Anderson now for over 20 years uh, running this product. Um, I head up the mid and small cap team, and I did 10 years prior to that at Morley Fund Management, so 30 years experience in mid and small cap. I've got two colleagues who work with me on the mid and small cap team at Janice Anderson, um, Indri uh, Van Heen, who's been on the team for the last um, 10 years, and Shiv for the last seven years. So pretty experienced, long-standing, stable team, and obviously we sit within the wider Janice Henderson stable um, in context, obviously, they're going to have very large AUM, over 300 billion global AUM, and obviously some very deep experience in terms of people we can rely on, touch on. But in terms of the key, the key bill for picking the stocks and uh, running the portfolio, it's the three of us, and, and I'm the lead manager. Um, start off, I'll give you a kind of the helicopter pitch for why small cap is an attractive area for you to invest in. Um, I think the killer slide or chart really is the bottom right of this page. Um, just showing the very long term returns from uh, a portfolio work for the Numis Index a proxy for the UK small cap market. And you see over kind of a 68 year period, and this is a kind of period that Professor Dimson and Marsh, the LBS, went back and back tested. Um, you know, £100 invested back in 1955 would now be worth over £725,000 um, and a much better return you would have got from um, a similar investment in the all share. So small caps have done a lot better than, than large caps over the very long term. Um, now, that's quite relevant in the context of clearly the last couple of years have been much more challenging for small caps. And I'll come and talk about why that's been the case. And to be honest, small caps are historically more volatile. They are less liquid and they're more prone to the economic cycle. But if you take a low, very long term view, have produced phenomenal returns compared to large caps. And the reasons for that listed there on the page, I won't go through in detail. It's clearly a, so in a sense that clearly growing from a smaller base is easier than growing from a bigger base. So growing from a small cap compared to if your BP and Shell is much easier given the size of that growth required. Um, so that kind of performance you can see there is an average outperformance of 2.9% per year, every year for the last 68 years. Um, so very compelling long-term returns from the small cap space. Um, although you must recognize that clearly there are, there's a degree more volatility and more, more kind of exposure to the economic cycle. Um, in terms of just, a, I'm going to run through a bit about the trust, uh, a bit about how we do things, um, to give you a feel for the kind of the product. So it's a listed investment trust, uh, quoted on the LSE in the mid cap index. Um, so it's a share you can buy and sell, buy and sell on the stock market. Um, its objective is to maximise your returns by investing in a portfolio of listed UK smaller companies. Um, the benchmark is the Numis index. That's relevant in the sense that. Our investment opportunity or investment set is really any company below about one and a half billion in market cap. So, you know, kind of halfway up to 250 is probably where we can go to. Um, fee structure, low base fee, uh, 0.35, very competitive. There is a performance fee on top, but obviously we have to outperform and also produce positive total returns. Um, a total fee is capped to 0.9 on NEV any one year. Performance, uh, talk about the um, last couple of years, we've definitely more challenging. Our long term record is still very good. I've run the trust for 20 years. We've outperformed in 16 of those last 20 years. The most recent period being more difficult, um, but certainly the long-term record is still very good. And we'll talk about it in a bit more detail. Size-wise, reasonably large and liquid, um, you know, over 600 uh, million in net assets, uh, mark up over half a billion. Um, yield, um, we pay a dividend yield. Um, you know, we'll talk about where we invest and what we like to invest in, but fundamentally we like profitable cash generative dividend paying companies. And therefore, the income they generate is paid to us as dividends and paid out to you as dividends. Um, and current yield at the end of September was 3.6%. Um, and we've seen some very decent dividend growth over our history. We've just actually um, achieved dividend hero status, AIC dividend hero status, which means we've got 20 years of unbroken dividend growth. Um, and it's been a 21.8% compound growth in dividends. And that really reflects the companies we're investing in and how they've grown over time and how they've grown the dividends and how we paid that back to you as shareholders. And then gearing, um, there's obviously there's some differences between um, a kind of open-ended vehicle like an OIC and an investment trust, um, fee structure being one of them. A second, an investment trust is clearly quoted and traded on the stock market, whereas an OIC is clearly more instant dealing. 
the third major difference is the um, that you can gear a trust. Um, and we have gearing in place. Clearly, it's beneficial in rising markets to have that gearing, and obviously not so much in falling markets. Um, but we've certainly had gearing in place for the last 20 years to positive impact uh, given returns. Uh, most of our gearing is provided by or uh, by long-term cheap debt, so 50 million of um, you know, 20 and 30 year money, and the rest is flexible bank borrowings. Um, so that's been, you know, certainly you know, our level of gearing, it's at 14.1 there, but it's now about 12.5%, um, and it's a reflection of the investment opportunity we see in the market overall. Um, I'll just touch on quickly um, about um, how we go about things at the trust and, you know, how we can construct the portfolio. Um, you know, I'll, I won't do in detail given time constraints, but just kind of a, a summary perspective, you know, we are growth investors. Um, fundamentally, we believe investment in equities is about growth, particularly in small cap. Um, however, we're not growth at any price, we're growth at the right price, um, so GARP. Um, so essentially valuation is important to us and you must pay the right price for the growth that a company is going to generate. Um, we are investing, we, we think, quality companies, because who doesn't? But frankly, fundamentally, how do we define that? And we talk about the four M's. And these are the characteristics we want our companies to demonstrate. And what are they? So first off is model, it's business model, it's economic franchise, it's kind of um, pricing power. Secondly, management. And we have a lot of opportunities as investors to meet these teams over a period of time. And as big investors, we get great access. But we're looking at things like their strategy, their motivation, their vision, corporate governance, Align with us as shareholders. Um, often, you know, small companies often driven up by one or two key uh, leading individuals who we get to meet on a regular basis. Uh, thirdly, is money. And money is balance sheet and cash flow, and that's really around strength of a company's balance sheet and its cash flow dynamics. Um, just for, for, for reference, um, injury myself and Shiver all accountants by training, so we hopefully can understand those dynamics. And then lastly, is momentum, uh, really around trying to find companies that will over deliver against expectations and grow quicker than people expect them to do. Um, in terms of the portfolio construction, you know, we are bottom up stock pickers fundamentally, although macro is important. Our value add is really from picking stocks. Um, we're long term, the average holding period says four years here, but actually it's more like five to six. So we're investors rather than traders. Um, and you know, fundamentally, you know, that's how we how, you know how we do things in our portfolios around 100 stocks. So low turnover, GARP, high quality, uh, and we run our winners. Um, I touch on performance because it's, it's very relevant. Um, look, I mean, we've had a challenging two years. Um, I won't deny that. Um, get the numbers here. Sorry, two seconds. Um, yeah, look, the last two years have been difficult for us. We've had a very difficult. Although I've mentioned before, the long-term track record is, is still very good. The last two years have been very difficult, probably my most difficult period as a fund manager in my career. Um, and yeah, to be fair, that's really messed up our two our kind of short and medium term track record. As you can see, this long term record still remains very valid. You know, since I took over running the trust back in October 2002, we produced 12.3% compound returns over that 20 year period, outflowing our benchmark by over 2% per year. And that's worked out as essentially a kind of a you know, a thousand percent total return. So your initial hundred pound investment's worth over a thousand pounds now. You put it back in 20 years ago. Um, so yeah, look, I mean, short term, it's been very difficult and we'll talk about why that's been the case, but long-term returns are still being very valid. So obviously let's talk about uh, performance because, oh, there are reasons for the last couple of years. And I suppose give, can give some context as to why we think things could possibly be on the turn or why how things could be slightly better in 24. So look, why have markets been so difficult in the last um, two years and why has our performance lagged? So a number of macro reasons and some micro reasons. So first off, you know, some macro in ascending order of importance. Um, so first up, COVID. Look, to be honest, I mean, I, I mean, COVID is a kind of a, a kind of a passing for a Western perspective, but during 22 last year, you still had the zero tolerance policy evident in Asia and particularly in China which obviously impacted global economic growth, but also definitely messed up supply chains, um, added grist to the mill, you know, costs of goods and moving goods around was, was more expensive on the basis of that, um, you know, economic um, difficulties and uh, lack of mobility in, in the Chinese economy. Um, wars are never very helpful for equity markets and, you know, Ukrainian conflict, you know, kicked off in Feb 22 and still unfortunately going on as we stand today. Now, in context, the Russian, Belarusian and uh, Ukrainian economies are not particularly important from a global perspective in terms of size of the impact on the global economy. 
where it has an impact was clearly on the, around the uh, time of the invasion was on commodity prices. So we saw sharp escalation in things like um, oil, um, gas, energy, metals and soft commodities, a lot of which have come back since. The more lasting impact has really been about gas prices in Western Europe, given the Western Europe's reliance on Russian gas and the turning off of those taps. So we've seen a big escalation in costs for both you as consumer, as you've been seeing through your own quarterly or monthly energy bills, um, but also for, for companies as well, who obviously are consumers of energy. Um, and that's really pushed down the supply chain. So, you know, things like, you know, for example, things like rapid food inflation has been really in some ways caused by by that energy spike um, and the cost of companies in terms of delivering uh, delivering goods. So it's certainly exacerbated what's been a general cost of living crisis for the for the consumer in, in, the, in, the, in the Western world. Um, UK politics haven't been helpful either. Um, no one looks back to Liz Truss's premiership with much degree of fondness. Um, clearly a kind of a, a period of massive dislocation and certainly didn't help in terms of the equity risk premium for, for UK markets. Um, and I suppose we have got a um, election coming next year and a potential change of government, um, which adds a bit of, you know, sort of certainly kind of uncertainty in that, in that aspect. But to be honest, look, I mean, these are all kind of factors, but the key factor why markets have been as challenging as they have over the last two years has really been about central bank policy. And if we want to cast our mind back to um, you know, late um, uh, 21, um, we were in a situation or a time where um, inflation was perceived to be transitory um, and central bank policy was very dovish. Um, and we've, as we moved throughout the course of um, the last uh, two years, central banks become um, incredibly more hawkish over that period of time. And we've seen a rapid escalation in interest rates um, from essentially free money to where we are today at between five and a quarter and five and a half for most kind of, um, you know, kind of the ECB and Bank of England and the Fed. Um, and obviously pretty hawkish messaging from the central bankers themselves, plus a move from uh, quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. So that's really, you know, and ultimately what they're trying to do there is they're trying to curb inflation, which has been obviously higher than um, um, kind of um, than they would want it to be, certainly above their target of 2%. Um, and, you know, they're doing that through essentially through demand destruction. Um, you know, they're trying to curb economic growth, um, slow, slow the economy down um, by having high interest costs and that impact that has on consumer and businesses, which are never very good for markets overall. So that's been, uh, ultimately, these are macro factors. Um, they're evident for the whole of the market. So why have we had a more difficult time particularly? Well, really, it's around that point, the last point here about the growth companies derating. And I mentioned earlier that we have this growth um, dynamic in our portfolio. Um, we like growth companies um, and they have essentially derated materially over the course of the last um, two years. Um, why that is literally, I suppose, it's a simple perspective. If you think a company's share price is the future value of its cash flows, as the discount rate or the interest rate goes higher, then the future cash flows are worth less and the valuation comes down. Um, and this is really you know, a, you know, identified or kind of shown here in um, sort of a stark fashion in terms of our portfolio. And this is uh, the top 20 stocks in our portfolio um, at the end of um, June this year, so quite recently. Um, and you can see the first column is just showing you the absolute share price performance between the end of 21, when markets essentially peaked, um, and the middle of this year. Um, and you, know, you can see some big red numbers there. Only three of our top 20 stocks have gone up in value over that period of time, and some other ones have gone down by quite material amounts. You know, over 50% in the case of Impacts, Watch of Switzerland, Team 17, uh, Future, for example. So that's what's happened on a share price perspective. Okay, that's 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 reality. It's what's happened. But what's been happening underlying at the, in those companies? And fundamentally, the story is much much more it's much more benign and much better than it actually the reality in terms of share prices. So you can see there. This is the earnings growth those companies have, de have actually delivered over that period of time. And, you know, you can see a much different shape, a much kind of different color. So of our top 20 stocks, 14 have grown their earnings and by some by some quite material amounts over that period of time. A few have gone backwards for, for various reasons. But on the whole, uh, corporate profit performance is generally very robust. Um, so average growth in the portfolio was 20 percent in, in 22 and is forecast to be uh, marginally up this year. Um, so it's not a case that the kind of companies are blowing up and everything's going wrong. It's really more a case of the, the multiple the market's willing to give to those companies. And I think that the third column just demonstrates that really in terms of what's been the move and the rating over that period of time, which is the last two columns. You can see there clearly, obviously, how a lot of our companies have essentially 
materially derated over the course of the last 18 months um, and quite some by some quite quite extreme numbers in terms of the multiple now let, with hindsight let's be honest about it um, I think some of the valuations on companies at the end of 21 reflected a decade of free money um, and probably some over exuberance and hands up you know fundamentally you know that's the kind of lesson we learned from this situation um, but where we stand today uh, you know I think there's a significant value opportunity in the UK small cap market so touching on that, I suppose, look, that's the kind of case of history. And, you know, clearly been a very difficult and challenging period. Um, I've been mean, a lot of fun to running money over the period. But, you know, let's look, in, look forward and why we can be slightly more positive about the future. As I mentioned earlier, look, I think on the whole, you know, there's always individual situations that don't work out as you plan. But on the whole, corporate profit performance has generally been fairly robust. Um, I said before, growth of 20% in the portfolio in aggregate in 22 and still growth in 23. So it's not as if the case that the, you know, the UK corporate is failing in that perspective. Valuation is being compressed. And I think literally, I mean, I think if you can have seen any kind of strategist piece on UK, um, UK stock market, they could provide you 55 slides while the UK is cheap and I'll give you two or three. Um, you, know, you know, this is a well-recognized thing in the situation that you know, the UK market does look very good value where to where you are today. Um, this first one here is really our, our own portfolio. Um, the orange line is the average forward PE multiple of the stocks in our portfolio um, going back over the last five years. And the black line is our underlying benchmark. And you can see there the derating from kind of 18 forward terms earnings to, to, to 11 times today. And we are now cheaper than underlying benchmark, which is unusual for us, given we're a growth portfolio. We typically find our stocks more expensive than the market um and um and um kitty you know growing faster but now we're in a situation where certainly we're as cheap as we have been for the last five years um and cheaper than our underlying benchmark this also reflects you know you know where we are with the kind of the uk market overall and this is just looking at um the, the, the kind of black bars here or the gray bars are really the, the range of where p multiples been over the last 10 years and you can see there today that the FTSE 250 which is a very good proxy for, for my where I look at in the, in the market is now trading at the bottom of its 10 year range. It's dissimilar to where the FTSE and the uh, S&P small cap as well are trading at. So cheap compared to history. Um, and also large cap v small cap, you know, small caps have derated materially versus large caps over the over that period of time. And you can see there that, you know, where we stand today at a 33 percent discount to to large caps is you know, at a level we've not seen for the last 15, 16 years. And how savage the derating has been over the last couple of years. So small caps have really done quite badly, but mostly because that derating um, as you know the as things become more challenging. So that's literally, you know, I suppose that point about, you know, we do think valuations are very compressed, there's definitely definitely opportunity there. Um, we've also seen, I think, you know, support from significant corporate activity. Now we are seeing quite a lot of you know bids happen in our in our market. Um, you know, that's essentially overseas corporates and private equity trying to exploit the value opportunity that's obviously evident. And this post page is, you know, a lot of their names here that just shows you the, the amount of deals that have happened in the mid and small cap market over the last couple of years. Um, you know, and you can see, obviously, the, from the flags, who's buying, it's mostly overseas, taking advantage of uh, undervalued UK corporates um, and a lot of PEP activity, private equity uh, activity in our space. So, you know, we've had five bids in our portfolio in the last um, four months, um, all from private equity. Um, so, you know, clearly exploiting what is a undervalued UK market. Um, I, you know, it's a point about, you know, balance sheets are strong. Look, I think, you know, if you look at our portfolio, over half of our portfolio companies have got net cash. There isn't substantial gearing. Um, you know, there is there are not huge financial risk. And I compare and contrast the GFC which I went through and that's very different because there was a lot of leverage in the system then um, and banks were very unwilling to lend generally um, and we needed massive equity recapitalization during 2009. This time around, although things may become tougher next year, you know, corporate balance sheets are very strong. Um, they, you know, so over half the portfolio has got net cash. Um, we don't expect some financial um, problems from kind of um, from uh, declining profitability and, and bank confidence. Um, companies think their own stock's cheap. So I mentioned before about dividends and how that's been growing. Um, certainly, again, we saw very strong dividend growth in our last financial year. 20% um, dividend growth from underlying portfolio companies, which demonstrates their own success and how they're doing. We're seeing a record number of companies buying back stock. Um, certainly in my career, it's probably the most of my portfolio. 
And I suppose why not? I mean, if your balance sheet is very strong and your equity is undervalued, why would you not buy back your, your stock? And, and also a lot of director buying. Um, you know, certainly if I had a pound for every time a CEO told me his stock was cheap, um, I'd be a, certainly a lot wealthier man than I am today. Um, and you know, they all think their stock is undervalued, and they're they're showing that through um, through buybacks and for buying their own stock as well for individually for themselves. Um, so look, I mean, yeah, small companies have had a you know, mat already materially underperformed large companies. And I suppose what is the catalyst for that getting better? I mean, it's obviously often difficult because of, sometimes catalysts are very much evident in the rearview mirror with hindsight. Um, but fundamentally, you know, if you look at a slide here, um, it's unusual for small caps to go through a period where they underperform for more than two years. We've obviously had that in the last couple of years. Um, the valuation gap is there. And essentially, I suppose it's a view that as soon as we see any sign and whiff of you know, interest rates, we think well, interest rates are basically peaked. We're pretty pretty sure on that now today. Inflation data is coming in um, a bit lower than expected, and we don't expect any more interest rate rises. The question will be when we get our first get a cut. So looking into 24 into an environment where as long as company performance remains very resilient, um, and we essentially see the, the dynamic of a kind of a falling interest rates and potentially improving economy towards the, the tail end of the year. You know, essentially, small company market, small companies tend to move ahead of that cycle, and they move ahead of the realities, and probably six to nine months ahead. So, you know, we're hoping that 24 will be a much more better year, um, both for the small cap area in general, and for us in particular, as we think growth companies will come back into fashion um, as interest rates start to fall and valuations can start to expand again. So that's a real whistle to stop tour um, through the fund. Um, you know, I think, you know, collusion, I mean, you know, last couple of years for us have been very challenging. Um, hands up to that. You know, it's not been a lot of fun. Um, we haven't changed our process philosophy. We're still doing what we always do in terms of trying to um, pick the right stocks and the right portfolio. Um, that GARP approach has not really worked very well over that time, although we still think it's very valid from a long term perspective. Um, a very consistent approach to investment. Um, and we've got a long term portfolio perspective uh, with a low turnover. Um, so that really concludes my kind of whistle stop tour through the trust. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that um, anyone has burning in their mind. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, yeah, that covered the ground very quickly. That's great. Gives us lots of time for questions. I um, just just uh, occurs to me you you talk about uh, growth at reasonable price, etc. Yeah. So through this last couple of years of uh, quite, you know, uh, market turmoil, as it were, have you essentially kept the same process, stuck to the same uh, principles? You've not changed anything in any way that in, in the approach at all, started to go more for value and less for no, growth I, or anything, but tempted to do that? I think, you know, I think it's, it's a good question, Mike. I think, you know, essentially, I think you always learn lessons from every cycle. Um, so, you know, I suppose, Big cycles I've gone through, you know, the dot com bust in in 2000, 2002, um, the GFC in 2008, 9, um, you know, the kind of uh, Brexit in 2016, the, the COVID crisis in 2020. So there's always lessons to learn from this. You know, I, you know, fundamentally, you know, we're quite clear about the way we approach um, constructing the portfolio and picking stocks. Um, our investors hopefully understand that too. And the last thing what they want us to have is style drift. So we have remained very faithful to our underlying um, philosophy. And what that's really transpired into is quite a low level of new additions into the portfolio because our own portfolio, we think, is so cheap. Why are we going to sell it to buy something new? So you know, there's always some degree of churn because things don't work out as you plan or, yeah. um, or there's some M&A activity which generates cash. But actually, you know, fundamentally, we've, um, I think, in the, the year just, We've just you know, 23, so 20, sorry, 23 so far, we've added, I think, eight new stocks, which is lower than our normal, um, which indicates although we're seeing opportunity in the market, we think our own portfolio is very cheap. So the, I think you know, that is you know, testament to the fact we aren't really changing our approach. And the things we are buying today are things that we probably would have liked to bought in 21, but we're on a valuation level we couldn't justify. And they've derated too. So we've had that a, 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 the ability to pick up some interesting companies that we like the business model and management and, and kind of momentum, but on a much more reasonable valuation. Right, thank you. And just one more from me before I'm, uh, by the way, everybody, do keep putting in questions for the Q&A and we'll come to them in a minute. I just thought I'd, uh, you know, host's privilege. 
Uh, I'll just ask one more. You uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the underperformance, if I can call it that, in the last two or three years versus uh, benchmark. And I was just looking at the peer group uh, in small caps for the UK market of investment trusts and so on. And you, you've sort of slipped down the uh, the rankings a little bit as well over the last two or three years. Um, is is that uh, and, and that's a little bit more difficult for me to understand because yep. you know you're all fishing in the same pond in that sense. But um, is there a, is there something distinctive about your portfolio versus some of the others? Do you ever look at that and think, oh yeah, I can see why we've slipped down the league tables a little bit and we're we're now sort of at the Man United position rather than Man City, if I could put it that way, as a Mancunian. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I'm a Liverpool fan, so I'll go that way, basically. So, look, I mean, I think, um, so yeah, I think there is, just, you know, that's a good question. Um, and, look, yeah, we do obviously clearly uh, um, look at the, the competition and peer group, and we do have a gander at their portfolio and see what they own and don't own and whether it provides opportunity and, you know, things that they own we, we could look at. So it's always that kind of, you always have that compare and contrast. Um, you know, we've, yeah, we have underperformed peer group over that period of time. I think there's two factors there. So the first is, I think the value type manager has done, done a lot better than us. So value has materially outperformed growth over the last course of the last um, couple of years. So someone, you know, some of those value-based trusts who are value orientated will have done a lot better. I think compared to the growth managers, um, I, I don't think we're miles, miles away from them, to be honest, actually. Um, probably we've suffered a bit more from high gearing um, in that respect. Um, you know, look at the OIC rankings was a good way of looking at. We're probably halfway in the table. It's, it's not, I mean, we're not kind of particularly content with how we are, you know, the performance and there's clearly and undoubtedly mistakes we've made in that time. Um, what I would say is we tend to be quite geared to the upside. Um, I saw a report recently that I think we had the best upside capture in that market. So, you know, fundamentally, I think, you know, you know, fundamentally, if markets go more positive, we're, we're, we're pretty bullish in our prospects of recovering that. Um, but I think, yeah, it's very much the kind of that growth bias has been definitely a detriment and we're not as stark against our growth um, growth peers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, your gearing is relatively high compared to the peers. Yep. At the moment. Is it was it the same position, say, if I look back a year ago, have you have you is your gearing higher now than it was then? Or No, like... gearing's, gearing is higher now than it was a year ago. I mean, if you think about our gearing, um, I can go between zero and fifteen percent um, uh, without, you know, board. Because we've got an independent board um, without board approval. Um, and typically, I'd say our gearing is around high single digit. is a typical gearing over my over my career. We where we stand today is higher, and that's a function of both falling markets. Because obviously, if your NAV falls and your gearing, your debt stays the same, your gearing by mathematically goes up. Yeah. But it also reflects the investment opportunity we see today. I just think there's a lot of a lot of value. You know, we see a lot of value in the underlying market and the portfolio, and that encourages me to be more geared than I than I would be, be normally, because you know fundamentally we see um, just deep value in our underlying portfolio. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's look at what everybody else has been asking. Um, first one up from Jay here. What what stocks do you, do you hold in builders other than Bellways, uh, and what view on builders and property? companies uh any views on a future wisg can't remember who they are as you hold i hold hsl thanks well there's about 10 questions in there so yeah okay fine uh, let's 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 do the building sector so look i think you know we in terms of the um house builders um you obviously bellway being a top 10 position for us uh we own that and crest nicholson uh, mm -hmm. it's funny one there's so you know you think today why you own a house builder um look i think it's about evaluation call um, we all know that the housing market is going through a difficult period. Rates of, you know, mortgage rates have clearly gone up substantially over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, transaction activity is quite muted. Uh, house prices are probably gently drifting off, and house builders' um, you know, earnings are are going are going down currently. Um, the call here really is that fundamentally, um, you know, Bellway's trading at 0.85 times its price, its book, its book value, and its book value is basically land and and, and work in progress. If I think back to my history of where house builders traded that over the last 20, 30 years, they typically between about 0.8 and 1.3. So the bottom of their range. Uh, and fundamentally, the, the share price discounts a lot of bad news about the housing market stands today. Um, and again, that point about when when rates start to come down and mortgage rates start to come down, these stocks will perform very well. 
And also, again, compare and contrast to, to 2008-9, hospitals had a very high degree of leverage. Um, so they were all very, very geared. Now they're all in a lot of net cash. So there's no financial risk and a lot of upside as to when markets recover. So we think there's a real value opportunity in, in the house builders today. And they'll, they perform very strongly in a, in a falling industry environment. Um, mm -hmm. We also, you know, we have other stocks in the building sector, things like Volution, which is a um, ventilation and air control uh, business doing really well. Uh, Genuit, which is a plastic pipe and, um, and you know, renewable type um, business. So some really, and again, they've all had a, Real struggle, but actually the share prices all reflect that. And if you think about their where they trade today on their earnings multiples compared to the recovered potential in an improving market and also the multiple applied to it, there is substantial upside on these stocks. So it's right to own these because you know this point about you know looking, we have to look forward. You know, fundamentally, although although the that building market remains challenged currently, it will improve and stock markets move ahead of their economic reality. And as soon as you get a whiff of improvement in these markets, these share prices will already have moved six months ago. So we have to take a slightly more forward perspective on that. We think they are good businesses in attractive markets, which have got good long-term growth prospects on cheap valuations. Okay. Was okay. there another question there at all? Was that, was there, was that well, like an... well, yeah, there was a bit of a, uh, well, he talked about builders and property companies, which is, I guess, a wider question, really. Yeah, so... yeah. I mean, property doesn't really fit that strongly. We got some, but it's, you know, fundamentally, we are generally underweight the space. It doesn't really fit with our 4Ms or growth mantra to be property. I mean, yeah, property will probably move again with interest rates. That'll be the kind of key determinant yeah, of their movements, yeah, but um, yeah, yeah. it's not really a kind of key area we'd be fishing. And, and then there was just a general comment about future and what's WOSG? I can't remember. Watch the Switzerland. Oh, yeah. Watch the Switzerland. Watch the Switzerland. Um, so uh, just a, a specific comment, a uh, question about those two, really. I guess uh, somebody's interested in buying. Yeah, it. no. Um, so look, I mean, future is one of those. I mean, again, look at that thing. It's been a massive derating of the course of the last couple of years. It's a consumer publishing business. Um, it gets its revenue from advertising, e-commerce and, and copy sales. Um, you know, they, they've going through cyclical pressures currently, um, around, you know, their key markets are kind of home and garden and, um, and gaming and tech, and they've obviously come off a lot since COVID. Um, so you've seen there exactly, if you look at that, when it's the third one from the bottom, it's seen some earnings, um, declines in the last period of time, but a massive derating. It also lost a very highly regarded CEO, um, but they've got a new person in place. I mean, look at it there. I mean, it's derated from 20 over 22 times down to 4.7 times. So very, yeah. very cheap stock. Um, I mean, they got results on Thursday, so we'll kind of um, wait with bated breath. But yeah, we do think they look very cheap. Um, and again, if it's cyclical recovery, we'll get that share price moving quite sharply. Yeah. Uh, and then watches, again, you know, derated material at the period of time. Um, key, key retailer, Rolex watches. And again, valuation looks appealing to us. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Satish. Uh, again, what, what what have you bought and sold in the last couple of quarters um, that you could tell us about? Yeah, look, I think I said before, activity has been um, relatively muted over the course of the last, um, um, you know, couple of years. And you can see here that in the nine months to September, only five new additions to the portfolio, um, and a couple since then, um, and obviously a few sales and obviously a few bids. Um, and again, this point about, you know, this really, you know, Clarks and Ergamed focus rate, Double Data and Spire are all new additions. Um, and that really is, you know, us looking at companies that we liked from afar, going back to over two years ago, the values were too high. Uh, and the recent decline in uh, vast values of um, growth companies have meant you've got an opportunity to get involved in these situations. What we are being is quite cautious about the rapidity of entry into these situations because you know, I think we've got time. Um, you, know, you know, there's certainly that we haven't really touched on it, but there's, there's a degree of technical pressure on the UK small cap market. Flows have been very difficult. You as investors have got the opportunity to put your money in a you know, money market at five, five and a half percent risk free returns. And, you know, therefore, why risk it in, in kind of um, inequity? So flows into our space have been generally very poor. So there's been a lot of, you know, essentially kind of forced selling um, by mm -hmm. investors in terms of flows. Um, so we've we've got probably we're getting some time and to look at these things and, and adding positions, but we are seeing opportunity, and we are constantly touring the market to find new ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody wants to know if you've got skin in the game. John is asking, do you and your colleagues own shares in the trust? 
We all own shares in trust. Um, yeah, I, I own far too many. No, no, that's true. That's not fair. I'm very, very aligned with you as shareholders. It's been a yeah, challenging last couple of years. But um, yeah, one of the things about Janice Henderson is uh, the bonuses we get, um, a fair portion of that's deferred. And then we get to choose where it's deferred into. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have deferred every bonus I've ever got into HSL. Um, which I suppose that I am aligned um, and I've also bought a lot of stock over, over my history so yeah I've kind of um, I'm very much sharing your pain and very much hopefully sharing your upside in, in the coming years. Okay that's good to hear. Uh, do you, Adrian wants to know do you think well basically he's talking about the long-term exit of pension funds from the equity markets in mm. the UK which we've you know has been well publicized in recent times by various uh, parties Um and 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 saying therefore the nature of the players in the UK market is so fundamentally changed that performance cannot be expected to return what was of was previously regarded as normal. So I think he's sort of questioning yeah. whether you can be as optimistic as you you might be about where things are going to end up uh, as as growth starts to return and normalise. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with that perspective in terms of the you know there has been a significant change in ownership of the UK equity market over the last you know 15, 20 years. A lot of pension funds have clearly de-risked. Um, gone global and gone into bonds and that's been a a feature that's that in some ways can wash through we've had that pain happen i think you know the stat about 31 percent of the uk equity market was owned by pension funds 10 years ago and it's now six percent so in some ways that pain is from what felt um Mm. you know it's also evident within our trust if you look at the the kind of ownership of this trust if i go back 10 years ago it was quite institutional and these days our biggest two shareholders are hargis lansdowne interactive investor so the private investor has taken more of a more of a share of that of that kind of, of that voice um right. you know i think fundamentally there's this point about is the uk market structurally you know structurally damaged i mean I, i'm an optimist in the sense that you know i think value ultimately plays out i've shown charts there showing the, the deep undervaluation in the uk equity market that at some point is exploited either by um, us as investors or by foreign corporates or, or some sort of a private equity so mm-hmm. you know you know to, to me it's a bit of fear, of fear and greed um you know we've had a re- good reasons to why you've been out of the market for the last couple of years but as soon as things start getting a bit better, you can see some quite dramatic performance. And, you know, small caps don't tend to do things in, in halves, really. I mean, I got that chart there going back over the long term. So I'll go back here. I mean, you can see how. Let's find it here. Um, that one there. You can see this annualized returns from the trust over the last 20 years. And there's some big numbers there. We don't yeah, tend to do. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you can you look at 2009, a good example. You know, 2008 was, you know, obviously horrid. But, you know, Worst, worst crisis since 2029. Markets fell significantly. We had a very difficult time. The bounce back in 2009 was extremely, extremely quick. Um, and again in 2010. So, you know, you know, small caps tend to have that, as I mentioned earlier, that higher degree of volatility um, and more prone to the economic cycle. So, you know, any degree of up, uplift in the um, in the sentiment or kind of um, or the perspective on um, how the economy is going, small caps can do very well. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephen says you've spoken candidly about the last two years and the varied problems. Uh, with with hindsight, what could you have done, or what lessons have you learned? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I mean, Self reflection there. No, literally, I mean exactly, and I do. I've I've kind of um, you know, had a fair few moments of self reflection and beat myself over the last couple of years. Look, I think let's to be honest, I think we'd have underperformed whatever in the last two years. I think it's almost impossible given the the nature of how we invest and the the style approach we take having a growth portfolio would have you know clearly wouldn't i think we, we wouldn't just not avoid it we wouldn't have been able to perform in in, in the world you know so yeah look that's but I, I think from a long-term view it's still the right thing to do it's the way i was trained the way i've trained the team i think it's generated very good long-term returns so yeah i think that's i, I don't think there's any reason to change that process um you know clearly gearing we could have been less on that I think today it's right to have gearing with where we are in, in the markets. And there are always situations, you know, look, let's honest, fund management is a 70-30 game. Yeah. You know, it's getting getting 70 right and 30 wrong is a pretty good average. We are going to get things wrong. We are human. Um, it's always a judgment case. You know, for everyone that gets something right, someone gets something wrong. Um, we need to make sure we get more right than wrong. We've got, we've done, to be honest, got a few too many wrong this in the last couple of years, which we need to correct. So, yeah, look, I do, I do, there's obviously periods of self-reflection. Um, we don't. We've 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 talked about the process, just the portfolio uh, to death as as a team, um, been reviewed, and you know you know believe that it's the right way to go forward with this, and you know we'll learn lessons. And I think that you know the lesson about valuation is an important one. You know we got a bit a bit a bit blasé about 
where Verizon's got to the end of 21 after a decade of free money. Right. Is that where, if you look at the ones that did go wrong over the last two or three years, where you think in hindsight, well, maybe you shouldn't have bought that, was that generally that you bought them at uh, too high a higher price? No, it? it's because, I mean, it's not because we bought them. It's because obviously that point about, you can see here that chart about the derating. It's not really about we bought them. It's just we owned them and then, then they went through a savage derating. So right. it's a, that's really where the problem came. It's not we bought something and it all went wrong. Yeah. It's the fact that generally what we thought are good companies and they are good companies have just derated materially. You know, it's the share price has fallen a long way because the market is willing putting a lower multiple than it did two years yeah. ago. And that's yeah. that is going to be a reflection of malaise and small caps, but also a reflection that rates are higher and therefore discount rates are higher. We think that's overdone. But to be honest, you know, I don't think we're going back to the to N21 valuations again anytime soon. I don't think we're going back to free money. We're gonna we go rates will come down, but it won't go down to zero. They'll probably settle at three to four. So you know, twenty is a new thirty in that in that sense, really. So we you know we we are very very cognizant of the valuation multiple that companies should trade on going forward. Okay, um, Gordon says that in addition to your comments on the forward PE and the cheapness of your underlying portfolio, in which sectors are you finding value to reinvest any proceeds from M and A activity? Look. Um, we don't, yeah. Look, I think we don't really, as I said before, we don't go from a perspective of, um, um, of, um, my dear, sorry, um, of we don't look in a sector basis. We look from a stock basis. It's very much bottom up stock driven. So we look across the whole market, um, and you know we're not that bothered about what sector it lies in. No, this is a um, typical shape of our portfolio: overweights and underweights in the various sectors, and this really is driven by the stocks. But it's very typical of what you'd find. And if you've seen previous presentations I've given over the years, it's quite similar. This is a typical GARP top portfolio. We're overweight those areas that have got higher growth dynamics. So software, media, electronics, you know, um, engineering, you know, cap goods. Um, so slightly cyclical, slightly more growthy. And then we're underweight those areas which are typically more value-based. So real estates, miners, uh, food producers. Um, so we tend to have a you know, we tend to look in areas that have got like GARP characteristics. Um, mm. And we're, 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 to be honest, fairly ambivalent about where we are looking in terms of the market for new ideas. Okay, thank you. Satish would like to know what your views are on the engineering sector, which is one of the ones you mentioned there. Going yeah, look. Next, yeah, you've already got Rennie Shaw. He may, yep. he may have some others. but We um, have. We've got, you've got Rennie Shaw. We've got Spectrus, Oxford Instruments, um, Morgan Advanced, Body Coat, um, so we got a pretty good exposure to the to that space overall. I think it's an area where you've got some genuinely really good companies in the UK market. And you touched on Renishaw, for example, has been a phenomenal long term performer for um, best organic growth um, driver of um, in the UK market or UK capital market over the last 20 years. Run as a private company, as you're probably aware by Mrs. McMurty and Deer. And we're only 50 percent of the company, but, you know, high R&D global market, you know what it does. Going through a cyclical downturn today, um, you know, particularly around semiconductor markets, but fundamentally it is to invest heavily in its product set, you know, really well placed for the growth going forward. And at some point, uh, Mrs. McMurty and Deer will not be here and we'll, they've looked to sell the business in the past and will in the future. So we find, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, the engineering markets, you know, they've, they've, they've come through the period. PMIs have really been, been negative. There is a degree of, you know, earnings pressure on the sector as we stand today. Things are slowing, but they can turn very quickly. And some of those early cycle names that we've talked about can move quite sharply when markets turn. Um, and we okay. think there's some really good companies in that space. Okay. What's the smallest company you would invest in? So that's an interesting question again. So, Louis, I think, um, you know, if you look at our portfolio, um, uh, we have got a high weighting towards the mid cap. Um, so this is the weighting by in, in the various indices and, um, you know, the reasons why we have that mix is because, you know, this trust is reasonably large. We run another three products alongside it with the same portfolio, two seg mandates and one um, OIC. So we run a, one of a billion in, 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 this, in this strategy. So therefore, if we want to get a meaningful position, it's very hard for us to access the micro cap area of the market. So if you're thinking of any company below 150, 200 million market cap, we just can't get the liquidity or the exposure to invest there. So if you want micro cap, we're not the product for you. We're very much, you know, smaller 
you know, large and smaller cap and mid cap being our key areas of, of focus. Although within that context, we're pretty, um, you know, ambivalent towards where we, we invest aim, small cap or the 250. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's typical shape of the portfolio. And really we need about 200 million market cap to be a really, you know, justifiable entry point for us to get a meaningful stake, a meaningful position in the portfolio. Do you have any liquidity rules to work through as well? Because even larger companies can have uh, maybe very small free floats to, to work with and so on. Um, yeah, look, I think we obviously take that into account. Um, you know, the investment trust hasn't got a liquidity constraint because obviously as a fixed pool of capital, we don't get flows like we do in the OIC and there's no daily yeah. dealing. Yeah. So we don't have that pressure of um, flows in and out. But, um, you know, we are from our risk team who obviously look at the product very closely. Um, um, they, you know, ensure that we've got liquidity, enough liquidity. So there's always situations that are more liquid than other situations. But given the mid-cap bias of the portfolio, it's generally quite liquid uh, mm. for, an under, for a small-cap portfolio. I think, you know, the stats would indicate I think we could liquidate um, over half the portfolio within um, 20, 20 days. Right. Well, as you point out, you're not going to be a forced seller. Uh, no, you know, absolutely. I mean, it's very much, very, very much more valid question for an open vehicle with daily yeah. dealing. Yeah. Um, and we don't do unquoted. Um, you know, fundamentally, it's not our skill set. Um, you know, that's not how we do it. We're basically listed only, um, UK listed only um, investments. Okay, thank you. Uh, William wants to pick you up on your point about Renishaw being a long term performer. He's a little bit mm. worried about the fact they could only raise prices by about 2% per annum on average. Uh, I don't know whether that's driven by the product mix or whatever, but is, is worrying is this cause for concern given the cost increases it's likely to be suffering? Does it lack pricing power? Um, I would disagree with that. Look, I think that you, if the, kind of the, the comments around pricing is, you know, you went through a period of very low inflation, um, you know, for up to the last couple of years, and a lot of companies have got fairly blasé about the cost price equation and therefore probably they didn't have the the need to to raise prices at that period of time um probably companies have rediscovered pricing power um you know you've had that period of relatively high inflation of input costs particularly driven by cost of materials and labor um, and a lot of companies have raised prices during that period to compensate that with a bit of a lag factor i think looking forward it's evident from the, from the companies we speak to that um, inflation on their own cost base is definitely diminishing so the input costs are coming down, um, energy costs have come down, um, raw materials have definitely um, have kind of they seem some deflation. And also even labor being a lagging indicator, it's quite clear that wage inflation in 24 will be lower than it was in 23. Um, and um, from company's perspective, the ability to hire is much easier um, and labor turnover is falling too. So I think labor markets tends to be a lagging, a lagging indicator. And we should see, you know, essentially kind of much lower wage inflation. So I think, you know, we've had a couple of years of high inflation, which has put, put some companies under a degree of pressure. Um, you know, Renishaw has pricing power. It's really value added product and they can raise prices um, compared to um, compared to the underlying um, market. OK, thank you. I, I saw somewhere um, and I can't remember where uh, that you also short stocks. Have I got that right? No, it's not correct. No, there's right. no short. Yeah. There's no shorting in the fund. No. Okay. Uh, I was I was surprised there, but I can't remember exactly where I saw it. Okay. Um, the uh, Adrian says, "Do you sell if a company moves into the FTSE 100, even if it's an outstanding investment with great potential?" Yeah, it's again good question. Yes, we. So as I mentioned, we run the winners. So we the new investments we have typically come within our benchmark size criteria. So I mentioned earlier about the new miss benchmark being our. Um, our kind of um, our benchmark, and that means one and a half billion being a cutoff point for new investments. Um, we though we can though if we buy something and you look at the portfolio, some companies there that are bigger than that. Um, like Renishaw, for example, being one, we've owned for donkeys basically, so we can run companies beyond the point of um, leaving that that benchmark. The point we are forced to sell it is the FTSE 100 entry, um, and you know to be honest, yeah, I mean you could lose some good businesses, and that's a, it's a shame, but it's a good discipline to have. Because ultimately, you know, we are meant to be a smaller company's portfolio and you don't want us, you know, you, know, you, you can buy your own FTSE portfolio, to be honest, actually FTSE 100 portfolio. And we're meant to do things in the small end of the scale. So it's a good it's a good discipline. We've had a lot of companies make that great over time. Um, that's just here. The one company we have in the FTSE current is Howden, um, which wow. went the FTSE in September the, of September. So we've got a, we've got six months to sell it. 
So how can we gone by March next year? And that's been a great, really great long term performer for us. Um, always a shame to see lose these companies. They, they move on. But you know, that's that's the nature of the beast, really. And um, yeah. I think it's exactly a good discipline to have. Yeah. OK, thank you. Right. Well, we're all out of questions, I think. So uh, excellent. Uh, thanks for answering all of those, Neil. And um, unless anybody's got any more, actually, that we finished five minutes ahead of schedule. So everybody would be pleased to be able to get to their dinner a little earlier, I suppose. So uh, excellent. Thank you for that, Neil. It was a good run through. Uh, first time I've had any opportunity to look at your fund, uh, your, sorry, your investment trust. So uh, it's given me a much better perspective on that. So thank you. Uh, and I hope we'll see you again maybe next year. I'd no, love to. Thank you for your time, everyone. And thanks, darling. And 